My name is Todd Kimball, and I'll be your MC on this Halloween. Happy Halloween to everyone. My best Halloween costume was back in the third grade as R2-D2. The shell of R2-D2 fit perfectly over my wheelchair. Probably should have saved that so you guys could see that today. But uh, unfortunately, you just have me in live and in person, not in costume. But I can say significantly more words than R2-D2. So I'd like to think my MC would, be, would come through a little clearer than if the R2-D2 costume uh, were here this morning. A reminder that humanism is a rational philosophy informed by science, inspired by art, and motivated by compassion. It advocates for the extension of participatory democracy and the expansion of an open society standing for human rights and social justice. And our reader today is the organizer, or as I like to call him, the Lord of the Readers, Mr. Al Christians. I got a reading today that it is relevant to humanism. It may, it may not align with humanism exactly. It's from a science book I read called The Age of Empathy from Franz De Waal. Uh, actually, it was an audio book that I read. Uh, and De Waal was a researcher with uh, various kinds of uh, non-human uh, primates, chimps and such. And he calls into question a couple of the things that humanists kind of have in mind. One is that humans are really special, which I guess we are, but he thinks we, we, get, we get a lot of it wrong about which ways we're really special. And the other thing is that we, we like science and he kind of blames science for, for uh, giving us a, uh, making us comfortable with kind of an abnormal idea of which ways we're special. So I, I pieced this together on, the, on, on a, a road trip from, a, from the audio book. Uh, and let's start with here. The reluctance to talk about animal evolution has less to do with science than with religion. When monkeys and apes are on every corner, no rainforest culture has ever created a religion that puts humans outside of nature. Monkey gods are common. Only the Judeo-Christian religions place humans on a pedestal, making them the only creatures with a soul, the only intelligent life on earth. Even today, we are so convinced of this that we search for such life by training powerful telescopes on distant galaxies. When the first live apes went on display in a London zoo, this was a chimp wearing a sailor suit and an orangutan in a dress, people could not believe their eyes. Charles Darwin thought that anyone convinced of human superiority ought to go take a look at those apes. We are continuous with all other life forms, not only in body, but also in mind. Science keeps looking for something special that we as a species can be proud of. And parenthetically, other than torture or genocide, which the wall mentions. And uh, this morning, as I was looking at the local news, I see Portland Opera is starting up. I think, well, maybe opera is special for humans, but then I remember the coyotes outside my window. Warfare and aggression are treated as biological traits. And no one thinks twice about pointing at ants or chimps for parallels for warfare and aggression. But uh, the things that uh, we do that we like, we don't look so hard to, at the animal worlds to find parallels. And there are lots of parallels for all these things uh, in the subject of empathy that the Walsh um, lists in his book. So just something to think about. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be playing a game today in part of our presentation. 
called Generational Jeopardy, and our presenter will get into that uh, a little bit later. Our presenter this morning, Mr. Steve Higgs, is the Executive Director of SAGE, Senior Advocates for Generational Equality. SAGE raises awareness about educational, environmental, and economic challenges facing future generations. It inspires older adults to work across generations to address those challenges. Steve practiced environmental law and studied collaborative problem solving as a Fulbright Fellow prior to joining SAGE. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree and a judicial doctorate. He volunteers for his graduate school, the University of Michigan, as a SAGE Legacy Fellow to engage pro bono experts to help advance climate change solutions. He is lucky to have many of the roles as a husband, dad, son, brother, uncle, cousin, and friend. Let's have a warm yet muted Halloween welcome for Mr. Steve Higgs. Todd, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, that's such a great, nice, uh, nice uh, remarks. Sometimes I wonder who you're talking about. Uh, anyway, so it's great to see each of you and, and a happy uh, Halloween. Um, I, I did bring today my my uh, my costume. I'm I'm going to go as the Lorax today. Uh, I won't wear this the entire time because I can't actually see anything uh, through these glasses. But uh, as any of you know, uh, Lorax was a creature in uh, the Dr. Seuss uh, uh, series um, called the Lorax, and and the, it's a story about a, a somebody who actually lives in a tree, and then when the tree is cut down, they pop right out of it and they say, uh, I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And the rest of the story goes on about actually protecting trees. And uh, I've always enjoyed that. Um, I also wanted to share with each of you a thank you. I have my humanist mug that I'm drinking out of this morning, which is great. In fact, I got two mugs, and so I'm excited to share that uh, with people, and I'll be have a chance to uh, talk with everybody. And um, I also just wanted to say uh, thank you for providing a, a forum where we can get together online. I know it's been really a challenging time, and I did bring candy for everybody um, right here, but I actually will have to eat it myself because I can't uh, I can't distribute it. To each of you, um, but I do. Uh, my heart is is intentionally meaning to share this with each of you, and uh, I'll have to partake on my own. So um, I did want to share briefly a, a a thanks not only to Todd and David who who helped convene and support me this morning, uh, but all of you for joining us. And I also wanted to thank my good friends Joyce and John uh, who are joining us on the Zoom as well. Um, I did want to quickly share an important uh, guest who is I've also invited into our presentation today and uh, her name is Lucky. Okay, well, a quick story. This is actually how I met uh, the humanist this morning was through my dog and I invited her to join us today. You can see she has her headphones. Uh, she is ready to, to come online in her desk chair and uh, she's also ready for Halloween as well. Um, and I will agree with that reading. I do think uh, there's a lot of uh, empathy that I share with certainly um, uh, one of my best friends, which is our dog. And uh, years ago through a SAGE program, I, I had a chance to, um, to actually uh, put, uh, learn about an initiative uh, called Fairy Dog Parents. And what that initiative was, was a way of matching people who had dogs with people who would like to have dogs in their life from time to time, but they don't actually want to have their own dog. And so uh, this person I was working with through our Legacy Fellowship Program uh, gave me an idea and my wife and I put out a message and we met uh, Joyce and John. And that our dog actually uh, created a bridge in our relationship with our neighbors in a way that I never imagined before. And it's turned into a loving relationship. And uh, we have had a chance to then share uh, birthdays and time together, and I've learned about the humanists along the way and all the other good hearts uh, and people in their lives, and uh, it's just nice to just have it all come together. So thanks to Lucky for joining us today in this conversation, and 
to my friends, Joyce and John, for actually inviting me to, to share this morning with each of you. Um, what I thought I would do next, I wanted to share just a quick video uh, to provide some context for what SAGE does. It does stand for Senior Advocates for Generational Equity. And 10 years ago, I had a dream and my life's been different ever since. In my dream, I was late to a meeting. It was like, oh my gosh, there are people waiting for me. It was almost as though I had lived uh, to go to this meeting. And uh, there were people my age who were waiting for me. And it was so real. I could see this sign, Senior Advocates for Generational Equity. The concept of SAGE, that was something that had never, ever been in my mind. I never have dreams like that. And I shared with my wife, Diane, the very real dream and she said hmm i just read a proverb a society grows great when its elders plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in anyway that was how sage was born and um, it's been it's been a lovely uh, experience for me ever since So Sage's mission is to inspire people over 50 to give forward with their time, their money, and their voice so that younger and future generations can thrive. Sage stands for Senior Advocates for Generational Equity. And whenever I share that with people, they think, wow, that sounds great. What's that mean? We stand for this principle of generational equity, which is a spirit that each generation leaves the world better off than they find it. So generational equity, it just means that all people, regardless of their age, are valued for one and also have opportunities to exercise their voice and to show that value and demonstrate that value to their peers, to other community members, and to feel trusted. And I think in our kind of current culture, we've lost some of the intergenerational connections that used to be very much just a part of everyday life. And so it's really important to kind of create space for that. One of the things that when somebody asked me about what does SAGE actually do on a daily basis, we inspire people to give forward for the benefit of younger and future generations. And we focus on the three E's of education, the environment, and economic opportunity, because we view those as fundamental building blocks for a greater society. How do we do that on a daily basis? We do that through leadership development, through workshops, through fellowships, all collectively are intended to help people find what they're passionate about, to learn their options, and amplify their impact. We have what we call the Visiting Sage Speaker Series. And it's basically where we bring in a great speaker who can elevate a core challenge facing the future. And there's our Legacy Fellowship. Along the way, we meet people who are entrepreneurial, nature they have a dream they want to make a deep contribution to community so we created a six-month program that includes training support to our legacy fellows to lead their dream projects and these projects run the gamut from building a community garden to um, leading long-term initiatives that educate students about the climate crisis the future needs all the advocates it can get and that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about encouraging people to become advocates for the future. Every minute, another 10,000 people become seniors. It, you know, our generation has continued to blossom. Now, SAGE recognizes that the people in this third stage of life are an asset. I mean, we have enormous opportunities to give with our time, our money, and our voices to actually make a change. I think there's a lot of big problems in the world that we're facing right now, and there's a lot to be gained from kind of creating opportunities to learn from one another and learn with one another. We're reminded of how important it is to connect with older generations, with younger generations, and to exchange ideas, exchange experiences and feelings so that we're all happier and healthier and more capable of going out into the world and doing good. When we put on an event, at the end of that event, you'll see three words, pass it on. And what that means is that we know we only reach maybe a thousand people a year in this community. And there's seven billion people on the planet. And everybody has that seed of inspiration in them. And so what I love about the work and where I feel most proud is not 
directly when we've inspired somebody, but when we've inspired them to inspire somebody else. There's a magnifier effect there, and that's how we're going to create and move mountains. Well, I just wanted to share a little bit of background about what the organization does, and uh, I do have a few more slides to cover. We're going to get right into that game, but hopefully that uh, provides a little bit of illustration, and I can share a little bit more as well as we go along. But um, I'll back to Lucky and <laughs> and uh, joining us in this in this today's conversation. One thing that you may have seen in the in that video that I just shared is a um, is a uh, is a proverb, and this proverb is a society grows great when its elders plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit and it's a greek proverb and i love this proverb i live for this every day and i value it so much and as we've done this work and as you may have heard in that proverb in that video as well is we very much now hold a view that a society grows great when anyone is planting trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in so much value in working across ages and genders and races and just working all across community and in inspiring training and supporting people to plant their trees of opportunity for the future. Uh, one of the uh, significant areas that we, we concentrate on is, is thinking about what, what does the future actually ask of us in the work that we do? And we keep this quote from Terry Tempest Williams in mind, the eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. And I kind of joked earlier on that I was the Lorax today uh, as Halloween, uh, but I have to say, I'm, uh, we're not the Lorax. Um, and uh, we don't have lived experience actually in a tree or in the future. Uh, and so we have to make assumptions about what the future would want of us who are living today. And, uh, and also recognize that, that as for the future, we very much view that our task is not entirely to foresee it, but to really enable it by creating opportunities for those who come after us to thrive. And when we think about what those opportunities are, we keep in mind that with each passing minute, in fact, over the last two minutes, uh, 500 people were being born. And they are our closest link to those who are coming after them. And we can think each day what will determine the quality of their life. And as we go through this work, we oftentimes keep in mind that this quote, the front is very long and the sense that the, the needs of the future are vast and the opportunities to do great work are really without limit. And part of the challenge for each of us and, and is who, who, who wanna be an advocate for those who come after us is to find that, that place on the front to dig in and knowing that everybody is doing the same and together you can solve really, really tough problems. Uh, Sage, we certainly believe that everyone has a gift. They have a tree to plant and, and that that front is very long. And part of our role is to help people find a place on the front. And uh, as some of you know, and you know from the video earlier today that we do focus on these three E's of education, the environment and our economy. And the core idea each day is to kind of help people find avenues, pathways where they can make a difference within these three pillars and they interrelate with each other as well. And then they do uh, help us um, connect with other people in community who are doing the same and together we can solve significant uh, challenges. As I mentioned in the video, we have about four programs. Uh, we have those visiting sage speakers that we highlight every year. We have discussion groups and workshops. We have a legacy fellowship program uh, where we help people launch their dream projects. And then we also offer innovation teams or action teams, which are uh, groups of people who are working together on a common cause for uh, several years. And so we have innovation teams that focus on promoting electric vehicles, uh, climate solutions education, uh, intergenerational mentoring, and uh, work related to uh, building uh, bridges across political divides, uh, which we call our citizen project. And one of the things that we're very proud of and 
we work at every day is how do we work across generations and how do we work with younger people in their um, grade school and their teens and their 20s and their 30s. Uh, because as Ward, uh, my good friend mentioned on the video, the future needs all the advocates it can get. And also, as we've come to kind of appreciate, the generations really need each other and they value each other. And there is a magic of, of connecting people in community who are sometimes not otherwise connected. And so that's a big part of what Sage works on every day. Uh, next up, I wanted to share this uh, game and I, I wanted to ask Todd, is this a good time to turn to that? Absolutely, sounds good. Okay, well, Generational Jeopardy is just a, a quick game that we like to play and uh, it actually has no relationship to the uh, Jeopardy, the game show, except for it does involve some questions. We've actually never offered this online. This We used to offer this uh, and play this in, in luncheons uh, around town and it's sort of fun. So I'm experimenting a little bit today. But the way it works is that there are uh, six questions uh, one in it, uh, two in education, two on the environment, and two on the economy. And you play this where I'll ask a question and you can just write down on a piece of paper or if you have a good memory, you just, just remember <laughs> what you said in response to the question. Uh, and if you want, you can raise your hand. I won't see you. I'm not sure anybody else will as well. Um, and you can certainly put answers in the chat if you want others to kind of see that as well. But the idea is you just follow the honor system uh, when I share the answer. Uh, just remember, you know, whether or not you got that right or not. And if you got it right, you get 10 points. Um, probably important to note, uh, no whining <laughs> or disputing the, the answers. Uh, some of these uh, matters are deep. They require a fair amount of kind of research. And we're learning and actively learning all the time. And there's all sorts of different uh, counter views and things that uh, we embrace and, and we want to actually listen and learn from. And so these are just meant to be prompts to get us all talking and thinking about some of the issues that we refer to as generational equity concerns. Uh, I wanted to share a little test question for each of you. For 10 points, true or false, humanists are cool people. Uh, and so that is true. I wanna make sure you know that. And, uh, and uh, so you should all get uh, 10 points, although that one actually doesn't count towards your score. But that's just how the game works. And if you do win, uh, I will ask uh, you all to keep track. Uh, I'm going to be giving out candy tonight in your honor. Uh, sadly, if we were in person, you would actually be receiving this candy uh, yourself personally. But I will actually do so in your honor. Um, wanted to ask if you have any questions. Uh, don't hesitate to about the about the method. Um, uh, have Todd just maybe check the chat and let me know. But otherwise, we'll just jump right into it. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Education and debt. So true or false, over 45 million borrowers in the United States collectively owe nearly $1.6 trillion in student loan debt. Uh, if you think that's true, it can dry it down as true. If it's false, false. And the answer is it's true. Uh, student loan debt is now the second highest consumer debt category in the country behind only mortgage debt and higher than both credit cards and, and auto loans. And Sage is concerned about, about the level of debt that young people do carry today uh, coming out of school and some of the challenges that that has in influencing their own life decisions and uh, their relationships and their housing and, and their jobs. And it's something that we've worried about when we started doing this work, there was $1.2 trillion and it's just kept growing and growing uh, at a pretty significant level. Okay, the next question is, uh, what percentage of job openings require education or training beyond high school? Okay, so if you are A would be 25%, B is 45%, uh, C is 65%, and D is 85%. So what percentage of job openings require education beyond high school. And if you had marked uh, C at 65%, you've gotten that right. That's 10 points for you. Uh, one of the things that, that studies are projecting now is that, uh, that 65% of our jobs in the economy today do require some form of post-secondary education. And so 
the debt is significant, but it's also important as a door opener for those who want to go on and, and achieve access to different types of jobs. Um, one of the things that we do as an organization that we like to spotlight is that there are so many organizations and community here in the Portland metro area and all across the state of Oregon that are working each day to help our kids succeed in school, uh, to make decisions about when they're coming out of school, what types of programming they might pursue. Um, there are great charter schools like Kairos PDX here in Portland. It's great uh, nonprofit groups like Start Making a Reader Today, where you can be a mentor and a reader to third graders. Um, there's great programs like Minds Matter to help uh, underprivileged students go to college and access scholarships. Sage itself runs an intergenerational mentoring program. Uh, so all of these initiatives and community kind of add up to helping creating economic, I mean, educational opportunities for our young. And um, we just appreciate the village of organizations that are working to do this work. Uh, if you want to learn more about ways to strengthen education, I, I will share these slides with uh, humanists as well. These slides have links in them. Uh, we, in the past, have featured a couple of speakers on this subject. One gentleman, Mark Freeman, he's the CEO of Encore.org. And he's written a number of books, but a recent one he wrote is called How to Live Forever. And it's about the enduring power of connecting the generations. And one thing that Mark uh, spoke about in that book is how important it is for older adults to remain connected to our kids in schools and how that can create a real win-win um, for our young and for our old and uh, creating a sense of connection and sense of purpose across the ages. Nicholas Kristoff, who's a speaker um, after Mark Friedman with us, and I've linked in there a book that he wrote with his wife, Cheryl Wudon, on A Path of Peers. And it's just a beautiful book that talks about different ways that people can identify causes they care about, how they can get involved. And Nick talks quite a bit about the importance of education and early childhood education as a door opener um, for kids as they get older in life. So I really recommend um, checking out those resources online as well. For Sage, uh, one of the things that I really appreciate is the opportunity to work with great people who are making a difference in education. Uh, one of the gentlemen I had a chance to work with a few years ago, his name is Jaime Torres, and he and a team um, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for underprivileged students to attend college. These are students right here in Portland through an organization called Minds Matter of Portland. And it's just an example of kind of good work that's going on right here in the community as a way to also address both the student loan debt concern that I raised earlier and also access to college and higher ed, um, which is also important too. And so um, kudos to people like Jaime and all of you and your networks who are doing work on, on education. I wanted to shift gears a little bit to our environment. And uh, this is another one of those three E's that we talk about a lot at SAGE. Uh, the first question I have is since 1750, so right around when we were being formed as a country, uh, the U.S. has emitted what percentage of the world's cumulative carbon dioxide emissions? So those are carbon dioxide is a global uh, warming gas. And what percentage have we emitted as a country? If you write A, that would be 10%. Uh, B is 15%. C is 25%. And D is 50%. So if you mark C, you got that right. That's 25% of the world's global CO2 emissions. And uh, as some of you may know, I believe today, or maybe it was yesterday, was the opening day uh, at the United Nations Conference on, um, uh, they call it the Conference of the Parties uh, that was set up under, I believe, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, back in the 90s. And it has carried on, and there are very meaningful conversations that are going on um, today and over the next few days uh, I will say that part of those conversations are very much influenced by the, the leadership role the United States plays in addressing climate change, and that what we do as citizens here in the United States and in Oregon and in Portland and in our neighborhoods um, can really make a difference. Next question is, how many plastic drinking bottles are purchased every minute? Uh, it, you can mark A would be 10,000 plastic drinking water bottles. 
B, 100,000, C, 1 million, or D, 1 gazillion. Uh, and uh, if you marked, uh, if you marked C, you got that one right, 1 million bottles. I actually technically don't think gazillion is a word, but uh, if you mark a uh, gazillion, um, maybe I'll give it to you a million. A million and a gazillion seem like pretty darn similar. There's a huge amount um, that are being produced um, every, every minute, every hour around the globe. And one of the concerns that we have um, certainly been spotlighted by the United Nations is if the trends continue, our oceans could contain more plastic than fish by the year 2050. Because uh, bottles and straws and all sorts of things show up in our rivers and they show up in our oceans as well. And it has really been uh, a concern and it's a multi-generational concern. Um, the amount, of, amount of, of impacts we're having on our oceans. And they're right here, even though we're, I don't know, 50 or 60 miles from the ocean, there are organizations right in the Portland metro area that are doing great work, uh, both on the climate, both on the oceans, uh, or on our rivers and our natural systems. And here's some examples of great organizations that we know about. Um, and, uh, and in fact, so, you know, I might later on today go spend some time in Forest Park because uh, providing, um, you know, those, those carbon sinks those trees do and the habitat provide for wild, wildlife is just a really important uh, linchpin in our communities. And it's beautiful to also visit uh, in these fall, fall times as well. I also wanted to mention if you want to learn more about um, uh, how uh, different initiatives to restore our earth, I point to a couple of resources on our website. Uh, first is a speaker we hosted, Paul Hawken. Uh, he wrote a, a fairly famous book called Drawdown, where they feature the 88 um, top solutions in the world to reverse climate change. And they're amazing solutions um, that are being practiced in, in every, all, across the, all across the planet. And if you click on the link in these slides, it'll pull up Drawdown's website and it'll be, uh, it's really illuminating. Um, the other event we featured uh, recently was with Dr. Sylvia Earle on the future of our oceans. And if you click on that one, um, when you get these slides, uh, that is actually to her uh, presentation. It's on our YouTube page, but it's about an hour and it's highly impactful. It shares quite a bit about what's going on in our, in our oceans and the role that each of us can play as stewards of our oceans. And so I just wanted to, to feature those two um, you know, resources for each of you. The other uh, good news story I wanted to share was from a friend of mine, another legacy fellow we work with. His name is Peter, Captain Peter Wilcox. He is working on a 12-year project called the Inside Passage Decarbonization Project, and it relates both to the climate and the oceans as well. And so, um, and that effort is to replace fossil fuels that supply vessels and ports in the Inside Passage with renewable fuels and power. And so um, it's really kind of, it's pretty exciting work, uh, very grassroots, but also working with a lot of different players, the ports, tribes, other entities, all up and down from um, Washington, all the way up through Alaska, that, that whole waterway um, of how do you actually geographically lead an initiative to replace uh, reliance on fossil fuels. And so just another example of some of the good people in community here who are doing things um, that sometimes relate directly to Portland, but sometimes actually relate a little bit beyond the region as well. I want to shift gears to economic security or economic opportunity. Uh, this is the first question that we have here. Keep track here. Uh, true or false, the federal government spends nearly as much on interest payments on the national debt as it does on children. And so if you say 10 for 10 points, uh, uh, whether that's true or false for 10 points, uh, and the answer is true. It's true that over the next decade, all categories of spending on children except health are projected to decline relative to our gross domestic product. And, um, and particularly with the debt, the national debt, that's an area that we as an organization are learning more about, leaning into. And, trying to come to understand the effects that the debt has on those who come after us. Um, but it is a concern, the degree of 
uh, spending on the national debt versus other uh, needs that we have today. Next question, 90% of children born in 1940, so several, a couple of generations ago, grew up to earn more than their parents did. Today, what percent of children earn more than their parents do? And uh, so if you say A, it'd be 20% of today's children earn more than their parents, uh, B, 50%, C, 70%, and D, 100%, I mean, all of, all of children are earning more than their parents did. And if you actually answered B, you'd got 10 points, that's 50% compared to 90% in the 1940s. And this is a question that's really pointing to an issue related, called the American dream. For a lot of you um, that, that they may recall, it means essentially a sense of upward mobility. That's the aspiration the children have a, set, a chance to economic success no matter what background they have. If they work hard and they play by the rules, the society will open up, will open up doors for you. And there's a lot of research right now that's pointing to a concern that children's chances of earning more than their parents, which is of course not the only metric um, for economic success, but it is a metric. Um, and, and that that has actually been declining over the years. And there are a lot of organizations in the Portland metro area that are doing tremendous work in this space in terms of creating uh, jobs and wealth, um, economic benefits for our communities. Mercy Corps Northwest, um, Cash Oregon, Impact Northwest, Join, Financial Beginnings and all the um, financial literacy work they do. Uh, just tremendous organizations and uh, doing good work and addressing uh, this fairly significant concern. I also wanted to spotlight three, I think, really meaningful resources on our website. Uh, one of them is a recent book, and our speaker, Robert Putnam, uh, he wrote a book called Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis. It's a really thought-provoking book with chapters all about uh, trends that have been happening across the United States over the last 30 to 50 years on the American dream. Um, we also, uh, after we hosted Bob, we also hosted Van Jones and uh, Van wrote a book called Beyond the Messy Truth and the Importance of Bridge Building Between uh, People of Different Political Views. And he does speak about the importance of working on economic opportunity as a real bridge uh, across other, other types of divides. And that um, presentation is linked, it's on the radio um, on our website as well, and you can check that out. And then just a few weeks ago, we hosted another visiting stage speaker on economic opportunity. Her name was Dr. Donna Beagle. Uh, she was uh, had conversation also with uh, Dr. Sharif Abdullah and together they talked about this concept of breaking the cycle of generational poverty, about the work that we can do to support not just um, people who are experiencing poverty today, but also people who have experienced poverty um, from generation to generation and um, some of the insights about uh, how that's different and, and what can be done. So I encourage you to check out uh, Don and Sharif's presentation. That's actually on YouTube and linked into these slides as well. Uh, I wanted to share kind of a good news story too that is related to both the environment and the economy. Uh, there's a couple of legacy fellows that we have been supporting right here in Portland, Dave Conklin and Carol Sweeney. And what they have been doing is working with a lot of other volunteers to launch uh, what they call the water box. It's this really innovative water treatment technology where if you put contaminated water in the box, you can do a hand crank and it powers a UV light and it purifies the water. And so uh, that is being used here in Oregon um, where there isn't access to clean water, uh, but it's also right now they're field testing this with a team of other people in, um, in Uganda uh, where there's a lot of challenges with um, public piping systems and water supplies, and people are burning um, wa uh, boiling water with charcoal and wood uh, indoors in order to purify water. And the whole idea is to see whether or not this particular technology can help ameliorate a lot of challenges at the same time. Air pollution, lost forests, climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and also just saving people's time as well. And it's, a neat, it's an example of a project that's being worked on right here in Portland, um, a group of people putting these things together. 
putting them on ships, sending them to uh, Uganda, and just testing this out in partnership with organizations who are uh, working in, in that region of the world. And uh, the last question I had for the group was, uh, this one's a bonus question, okay? It's a little surprise. Uh, for 20 points, uh, true or false, everyone can make a difference. Uh, who thinks that's true? And if you do, you got 20 points uh, for you. And, uh, and so if you've got a perfect score, you should actually have 80 points right now. And, uh, and that would be, um, that would be you know, the, top, the top score. So I just wanted to pause really quick I'm curious, does anybody here actually get all of those? Let me take a look at our gallery here. Yeah, see what's coming up. If you I'm got sure, all people I'm are sure we got them. some 100% in here. All right, let's see a show of hand again. How many people got a perfect score? Yeah. Oh, okay, Gretchen, I see. Gretchen, Gretchen got a perfect score. <laughs> okay, that's terrific. Well, Gretchen, in your honor, I'm looking forward. I will share. Uh, uh, I will I will share that, and uh, I wish I could see you in person right now. I'd be handing over something of value to you. Um, <laughs> anyway, congratulations to you. And uh, all right, well, I'm just gonna I got a couple more things to share before we jump to some questions and such about the work. But um, congrats to Gretchen, and congrats to each of you for for playing along with that. Uh, hopefully, that was fun and does raise awareness about uh, some of the issues that we're working on. I did want to kind of share, uh, if I can, this, uh, uh, there you go. What we, when we talk about generational equity concerns at SAGE, uh, what, we're, what we're really talking about, and there are three different types of, of issues that we uh, pay attention to. One of them being, we sometimes refer to these as time bombs, uh, where there are risks that may not threaten today's generations, but they do significantly affect the future. And so uh, when you're looking at issues in society, areas of concern, uh, if you see that at play where there's risks that don't affect people today, but they can affect people significantly in the future, that is sometimes referred to as a kind of a ticking time mob where you're safe today, but you're not, you're not tomorrow uh, necessarily. Another type of generational equity concern comes up with what we refer to as course corrections. Uh, this is where there is uh, today an early indication of harm, uh, but we continue down the same path. And issues like the climate are, are a good example of that, where today there already are uh, refugees from rising seas. Uh, and um, we have certainly this summer, for those who um, suffered through the summer uh, heat domes that we experience. Uh, there are people who are affected uh, immediately today, uh, but nonetheless, if we continue down the same path uh, uh, without course corrections, that, that's, a, that's a generational equity concern. And then another uh, type of generational equity concern is what we refer to as the tug of war, where the swifter response to a problem can result in, in higher near-term costs. Because um, society sometimes is not actually positioned to, prop, to easily solve a problem. But the slower response um, actually results in higher long-term costs. So there's a, there's a tension between which generation is going to bear the, the, the challenge to address a problem. And we sometimes refer to those as a, as a tug of war. I will say one of the reasons why, at least for me, I think some of us do, do have, it's hard to focus on the future is, is for a couple of reasons. So scarcity of attention today is the day. The interest of here and now often take precedence over tomorrow. And the other part that we're doing a fair amount of thinking about at stage is, is the fact that, that today's voters in a, in a democratic process are accountable for the demands they have demands today, and, and the government is accountable to today's voters. It's, it's uh, you know, democracy for the people, by the people. It, it certainly does encompass uh, the needs of the future. Uh, you can see that in our own U.S. Constitution, uh, talking about uh, posterity. And that's a reference to those who come after us. Uh, but at the same time, our, our democratic practices are very much uh, linked to today's, today's needs. And... Uh, you know, the thing that we've, we've been exploring is, 
and recognition, and this is sort of my personal view, I think probably a lot of people share this, I've seen this with the humanists, you know, sometimes the, the democracy, they say, uh, it's the worst form of government, except for all the others. And so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very special uh, way of making decisions. And at the same time, there, there are shortcomings. And one of those shortcomings or concerns is how well it addresses the needs of those who cannot actually vote. Uh, who are not with us in our in our practices today, or at least it's not it's not always clear. And one of the areas we've been focusing on is this concept of a guardian for future generations, which which some some countries do have uh, to essentially bring into the democratic decision making uh, a representative uh, from the future. And so uh, this is an area of, of innovation that we've been uh, evaluating at Sage. For us, why is it important to focus on the future? I will say, and this is probably a link to the humanists as well, is that we have a duty, a duty of care to each other. We have a duty of care to the future. Uh, we very much view ourselves as a link in a relationship between the past, our ancestors, the present, our neighbors, our family today, and of course, those who come after us, our future. And so we just think there's, a, there's an important human aspect of, of, of focusing on the future, um, which is also, in my view, not, not unique to humans as well. Um, irreversibility. Uh, there is a, uh, I think, insight, knowledge now that we are able to impact the future for many generations to come. Uh, Chernobyl is a great example of that, where um, while there is recovery occurring in Chernobyl, it has been a, uh, a region of the world that has been shut off for many generations. Um, and so we're able to have irreversible effects. Uh, one of the things that's also, I think, becoming increasingly, um, you know, people are aware of is that we do have a, quite a bit of knowledge. We have capacity to control our actions. We have the ability to address future risks in ways we may never have been able to do before. And we have the ability to leverage opportunities. Um, there is a lot of work and innovation and, um, and that's what makes this work exciting too, is ways to use knowledge we have today to create doors or open up doors for those who come after us. And then lastly, um, another area of uh, why it's important to focus on the future is a sense of fairness. This is the generational equity part of SAGE. Uh, we very much are aware that the future cannot, at least as, as far as we know, cannot easily affect the present. Um, but they will experience impacts from today's actions, uh, both good impacts and, and bad or challenging impacts. And, and that's another reason why we think it's important to focus on the future. And as you saw in the video and in some of the things I was sharing about individual personal actions about making a difference, this is really the question for Sage. What can one person do? And because each of us is individual, we hope it's a question for you for you too. And for those of you who are just actively working on, on community concerns every day, um, the first thing I, I would say is thank you. Uh, thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for all the work that you are doing to strengthen our communities for today and tomorrow. And for those of you who are um, exploring and, and thinking about ways that you might be able to make a difference, um, here's some three simple tips. One of them is to kind of identify an issue or challenge that's facing the future that you'd like to learn more about. Um, sometimes when we work with people one-on-one, -on -one, we, we talk about keeping a journal for a couple of weeks, just jotting down ideas of what you're noticing in the world, what sort of issues are speaking to you, and then leaning into those um, by relying on you know, meaningful resources online um, in the libraries, to help kind of learn more about that challenge. Uh, based on what you do know, uh, what you either know today or, or what you've learned over the next few weeks, you know, thinking about what's one action that you can take to address the issue, however small, however big, what's one thing that could be done and just keeping it in that simple and just thinking about how it can help. And then the third thing that I've come to appreciate over the years is how important it is to do this work in community with other people. I mentioned earlier on the front is very long and how important it is once you have identified an area of concern to work together with other people who share that concern. There's a real energizing effect in working in relationships and caring relationships 
because this work can be hard. Um, I wanted to share a few more kind of quotes that I've always admired um, that I think ring true, certainly for me in this work and, and hopefully for you too as well. Don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And so when we're doing individual coaching with people and, and they share different challenges they're concerned about in the world, uh, this is really a center point is focusing on things that really light you up. Um, because as a, as a community volunteer, as an advocate, these work, this, this work can take years uh, where you can make, you can see progress and sometimes you never see any progress. That's the whole idea of the Greek proverb, uh, planting a tree whose shade you know you, never, you will never sit in. Uh, there's a lot of activities where you're working on things you can't see the progress on a daily basis. And it's valuable to work on things that really make you feel like you're alive. I also uh, I find myself having to remind myself of this all the time. Uh, a ship in this harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. I will say in this work in community engagement, it does take a fair amount of courage. Uh, I have uh, a friend of mine who uh, is um, a mentor and he shared with me the difficulty of actually going into a seventh grade, uh, a middle school and, and just feeling uh, almost out of place and concerned and weird about the whole experience. And yet it's so important and it became so important and it just takes a lot of courage to go out to sea and to use your gifts and your time and your talent. And I just wanna rec recognize that, that that is not uh, an easy thing to do, um, but it is so important. And the other uh, final thing I wanted to share with each of you is, is just uh, some wisdom from Anne Frank, uh, that there's a certain urgency to this work. Uh, no one needs to wait another minute to figure out how to save the world or improve the world. And uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom in this simple comment. And I just encourage you as you look at the issues in the world that you're concerned about, um, uh, don't let a day go by uh, to, to think about a way that you can make a difference. And, and to remember that we are grateful for that. I will share if you ever want a, any help along the way. Uh, we regularly meet with people. We offer what we call free cups of coffee or tea. Now we're usually doing these meetings you know, kind of one-to-one, -one. Um, but it's a way for us to kind of listen and learn to what really lights people up. And if there's a, a, a partner organization we recruit for, or we even in a platform within SAGE, um, uh, those one-to-one -one meetings are really meaningful. And then lastly, as I mentioned in the video earlier, there's something you took away from today's conversation. Uh, please pass it on. Uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, billions of people who we can never um, meet through our work. And, and we are so grateful for any, uh, any help and community to, to share some of the information that, that I've shared earlier today. So, and thanks to each of you again for, for just taking the time to listen in. Steve, thank you so much for an engaging and informative uh, presentation today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'll start out with the first question as I wait for other questions to come in, and I know that there will be many questions today. So I was truly inspired by your organization and its mission, and I've got quite a bit of time on my hands right now, and I know that we have other audience members that have some time that they'd like to give. Um, give us a sense of um, the different ways we can get involved in the organization. I was very impressed by your speaker series, but could we be engaged in a, on a daily or a weekly or a monthly basis? Give us a sense of that. Uh, thanks, Todd, it's a great question. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the first thing I would say, Todd, is, um, you know, whenever we work with a community like the Humanists, uh, our, our first uh, passion is, is how, how can we nurture and support the Humanists, you know, in organizations where you're already involved. And so I think that there's, if there's pathways within the Humanists too, that's um, that's always something uh, I always just like to make a, uh, a, a share, share the, the passion for how valuable it is to, to continue doing the volunteer work within the organizations where you're already working. 
Um, and the thing though is the truth that something I've come to appreciate is that uh, the door is wide open to work with lots of organizations and community. And there's something fun that comes from doing that too. And, and so Sage certainly has, we have about a hundred volunteers uh, in our work each year. And we have volunteers who work um, sort of, I think right now, probably the most uh, concrete uh, work that is a, there are volunteer engagement opportunities is through our teams. And so, as I mentioned, we have those four teams and there's one that's related to, uh, if you're interested in climate education, we have a whole series of work that's in our, our, our middle schools and our high schools in the Portland metro area to teach a lesson on the climate action plan and our 2030 climate, climate goals and the workforce opportunities and the hands-on um, kind of learning experiences the students can access. And so that team is called Vision 2030. And what we do is we train people to be actually educators in the classroom. Uh, these are volunteer educators and increasingly also involve um, people in how to promote this speaker series we now have with Portland Public Schools on workforce opportunities related to climate change. So there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of meaningful work, um, a lot of people involved with Vision 2030. Uh, the other effort that we have that I mentioned is called the Citizen Project. And the Citizen Project is a project we started probably about four years ago to uh, bring help support people who are in different, who have different political views to come together and work together to solve public problems. And we have defined public problems uh, the way that a foundation called Kettering uh, defines them, which is problems where uh, pretty much everybody ag agrees it's a problem and they agree that something ought to be done but they disagree about what should be done and, and therefore creates a complexity about how do you actually move forward. And so SAGE offers a fair amount of public programming. Um, and a lot of this is, is powered by volunteers who help us figure out how to bring forward public programming that elevates um, the challenge of working across political divides and other types of divides in order to solve public problems together. Um, and some of those workshops and discussion groups are really um, more focused on like skills, like deep listening, and, um, and also skill, uh, the types of workshops that other organizations offer. And some of them are more like presentations. So for example, um, presentations about what is different today than 30 years ago, um, and how are those differences sort of affecting the political um, rancor or the toxic media culture that we have and the challenges that we actually observe um, on a daily basis around working to bridge divides with people who hold different political views. So there's a fair amount of work within the Citizen Project, Todd. Um, and then uh, the other initiative uh, we have, I mentioned is a intergenerational mentoring uh, program where we have um, older adults who are mentoring sixth, seventh and eighth graders on English language learning. And they're doing this online um, they're supporting a particular school called Park Rose School District. Um, and, and we're not actually currently recruiting mentors for that program, but we are interested in expanding that program to other school districts. Because we, we actually have a lot of people who are interested in mentoring online and English language learning. And we're interested in expanding that program to other nearby districts. And we were very be open to working with volunteers in that regard too. Um, the last thing, Todd, I will say is uh, there is uh, something that's very helpful for us. If anybody ever wanted to host a gathering uh, where if they have a community, you know, Sage for many years, we, we would host gatherings in living rooms. Now we're slowly considering doing that again, um, people who are vaccinated and such. But um, we used to call these Sage socials where we would simply sit around. We'd have a, a chocolate cake that was um, baked by my friend and our board chair, his name is Ward Green. And um, the, the cake uh, was a recipe from his grandmother. And we would, we would have a conversation around, uh, in the room, around the, challenge, the, the opportunities that each of us have had in our life and the ways that, and our concerns for the future and the ways that each of us can make a difference. And those safe socials, while they weren't really designed to kind of lead to specific action, they are definitely a conscious raising kind of conversation that helps people sort of reflect on 
uh, how do they end up where they are? And who are the people who are older adults in their life who open doors for them along the way? And how could they then kind of consider being that person today to somebody who's young? And those sage socials are really valuable. We, we offer them online as well, but they are a way to kind of kickstart a meaningful conversation. So hopefully that helps, Todd. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Lots of ways to get involved. Yeah. Our next question comes from the humanist with the ironic name, Mr. Al Christians. Okay. Yeah, Al. Yeah, I've been... Uh... I'm, I've been thinking a lot about this since I'm getting old now, and uh, I, I, I kind of, I kind of agree that we need a longer-term element in our thinking. But a lot of things about this long-term thinking are seem seem to me have are are based on some false premises that uh, uh, it's easy for somebody in my position uh, as a humanist who doesn't believe in after your life necessarily to think that, oh, I can do something now that will somehow make me immortal, even though I'm going to die. And that that's kind of a fallacy that we might, might be, we're operating in the, a lot of the minds of the people who get drawn into these, this kind of an activity. And the other thing is when I look at things that have lasted a long time in the, on the world, like say um, America, which has its constitution lasted has lasted about three or four times longer than any other constitution in the Americas. Well, we're not the good guys if you look at your questions that you gave your six questions that you gave us. So we've built something here that that lasted a long time, but it's not just not all good. And you know, you look for other long lasting things. Yeah, well, you got the Catholic Church, you got the British Empire, you got a lot of things that aren't so good. So I, I kind of go with the Anne Frank thing uh, that, that, you know, do it now is is pretty much what everybody needs to do. So I'll I'll support you on that. I, I wonder if you if you try to try to um, how do you manage that? It's like, oh, yes, we're thinking long term, but it's it's more like long term change than long term stability. Well, Al, I appreciate that question. If I if I understand right, too, I, I guess our our vantage point is uh, that you know we work with people who have different kind of worldviews and different ways they want to they they sort of see see issues in the world or even their role, whether it's generational, past, present, or future, or just focusing on today. And um, and for us, I think it's the action that really matters. And so whether how you come to that action and how you're motivated to do so is um, it's important for us to understand, but it's also important to us that, that there's a place on the front um, that I described uh, for everybody. And, and uh, hopefully that helps. I just wanted to reiterate that. So um, if I'm, if I'm understanding your question, right, I think uh, yes, that's what I will say. Yes to Anne Frank. Um, I'll read a comment uh, with a question at the end from Nada. Uh, not to offend our male members, but I'm wondering how to change attitudes like work that is being done to decrease assaults on women instead of teaching women how not to be a target, teach men don't rape. We need to change the culture to a caring community instead of one that scrambles to fix problems as they come up, how do we do that? That's a great question, I appreciate that. Who was that from again, Todd? That's from Nada. Nada, thank you for your question, I appreciate that. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I will say that I've, I, I appreciate is sort of a fancy word for this, they call it innovation diffusion theory, but it's basically shorthand for um, people talking to people. And I wanted to share a story when we first started, and this is very much uh, part of, of, of what uh, Sage believes in and I, I, I support is, it's inspired by this work. I think it was in Bangladesh where for years they were working to address the infant mortality rates for newborns. And they had billboards and they had these media campaigns and a lot of, a lot of you know, very public programming 
to address um, ways to actually lower infant mortality. And what they found after they decided to instead train uh, midwives to go uh, community by community and being working side by side with people in community that the infant mortality rate went down way significantly much more um, by actually doing a relationship-based person-to-person type work. And that's something where I, I certainly believe that there is a, uh, a special kind of um, opportunity in having individuals talking to individuals about ways to make social change. Um, and the story from Bangladesh is something I'm aware of, um, but I will say that applies in a lot of other cultural uh, issues of the day and um, you know how to actually help women um, uh, you know in in uh, addressing you know and combating the challenge of sexual assault and rape uh, is all hands on deck as far as I'm concerned like there is so many important areas of work uh, but I would never want to uh, discount the value of having uh, men for example talking directly to men about how to be an advocate um, and how to how to help um, um, you know honor and and, and 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 safeguard the rights and interests and and well being of women and so there's something in having um, uh, in that in that personal exchange that I really value. It's not an area uh, that I have a great deal of expertise. I just think there is value in having um, in having that person to person you know uh, conversations as well. Hopefully that helps. I'll read a question from Joyce that's an extension of my question. Uh, so to get involved, we set up an interview with you and figure out where our energies would be most valuable. Is that, how, that the first step? Yeah, absolutely. Joyce, I appreciate that question. That's, it's, a, it's a really straightforward way to connect with us. Is I sent the, and I can share it back with you, Todd, as well, the just contact information. We have, um, I'm the only full-time staff member at the organization, but we have four other people who work at SAGE and they work on specific initiatives. And uh, the thing that we really value is the chance to listen and learn about what somebody is really concerned about. And you know, SAGE does have uh, about 15 initiatives going on simultaneously. And so sometimes it's hard to just say, oh, we should get involved in this or that. We really like to center our, our conversation in what is really important to the person who we're talking with. And sometimes it's, it's they're already, well, oftentimes actually people are already working on something and it may be uh, a conversation that leads to how can we help you in what you're already working on. And I'll give you an example. When we, I mentioned we have our legacy fellowship program where we, where we train and support people to um, lead their own community benefit projects. Uh, the majority of the time with the fellow we work with for nine months, they are already working on a project. And where they benefit from SAGE is a certain degree of community and training and love for what that person is trying to bring to life. And that stuff, you know, particularly if been working on for something on a really difficult challenge for many years, it can become isolating and, and, and um, you lose hope, you have doubts, and, uh, and it helps to have a friend who cares about what you're trying to bring to life. And so... There are specific needs within SAGE. We rarely value that. But I also, one of the values of the one-to-one -one is just to kind of meet you where you are and where, where you feel like you're, uh, where you're struggling and where you could use some help, okay? Yeah, I love the synergy that you're bringing to communities. I really uh, love your collaborative approach and, uh, and the way you're doing things here. I'll read a comment and a question from Helen. Uh, she says, uh, my interests are backyard habitat, providing native plants for birds and gardening. Do you have people working on these issues or in these areas? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. We don't, I, SAGE itself does not have specific initiatives related to habitat uh, and certainly habitat at the, you know, at the backyard level. Um, but we do recruit and promote uh, three organizations that have these programs. And so uh, the Columbia Land Trust and the, there's two other, I think it might be um, Audubon and another one. I can, I can kind of do some more research on this afterwards, Todd, but there are some organizations that work on the Backyard Habitat Program. And uh, the first thing I will say is it's awesome uh, from my experience. 
and that uh, they need help. <laughs> and so, and I don't know all of all of where there where there are, but I think the the, the there is certainly collateral. There's ways that you can actually um, work on habitat, and then there's always roles for how to be an advocate to involve other people in our community because you know we do would have imagined and appreciate the idea of Portland itself being a, a, a healthier habitat for all the species that have historically associated with this region and those who are coming uh, because of a warming climate as well. And the degree that we can create habitat through whether it's supporting pollinators or native uh, plants or even uh, transitioning our region because it's warming uh, to being uh, a, a better refuge for um, uh, heat kind of heat spikes and such. There's a lot of work in this space. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would say, Todd, is uh, in that space, we'd probably be more of like a connector, um, but I'd be happy to be that connector. Okay. Sounds great. Sounds great. It looks like uh, Joyce has a question. She would like to come on and ask. Here we are. Um, I've already had a question, so I'm gonna make this quick. Uh, I have two quick points. Uh, Nada might be interested in an article from the New York Times in uh, uh, October 19th about a domestic abuse hotline taking um, aim at machismo in Bogota, in Colombia. Uh, women, are, uh, there's a hotline that's prov that is provided for men abusers to call and ask for support and help and change. Um, and I thought that was a fascinating approach. And the other thing, just very quickly. Um, we do have, uh, the humanists have a building trust project, which sounds very, like it would benefit very much from talking to someone from your citizenship project, because we have struggled to connect with people from the opposite persuasion, political persuasion. So we need to check in with you on that. Yeah, I appreciate that, Joyce. And um, I will also say, because there are, um, there are shared challenges. I don't think it's just the humanists. I think that uh, there are there are shared challenges between with for a lot of organizations. We we work with a group called Braver Angels, another group called Crossing Party Lines, right. uh, Oregon Humanities, um, the and then other groups that work more on like uh, K through 12 civics education. And you know it's it's a it's a challenge of how do you do this work. And I will say for us, the more that uh, we invest in deeper partnerships. Uh, with organizations that maybe are uh, representing uh, people of different political views. For example, we're um, we're just working and identifying organizations that more work outside of the Portland metro area, and um, that may just have kind of carry different different values, uh, or at least different priorities and different different moral and ethical views on politics and. And this ways to kind of concentrate on how um, we could identify public problems where we could work together on it without always sort of spotlighting the fact that we may be disagreeing politically. But sometimes if you can orient on actually let's solve a problem that we all uh, believe is a problem and we all actually have a stake in addressing it. Something I wanted to share with the group too, I don't know if you've all had a chance to look at the, the work of the Oregon Values and Belief Center. It's called OVBC. Yeah. Uh, and it is a wonderful organization that's doing polling, statistical work across Oregon to identify what are those bridges, those, those topics that are actually shared in common between people with different political views. And they've, they've done some preliminary work to identify uh, investments in K-3 through education, mental health, uh, local job creation. There are, there are a lot of sort of topics that are kind of viewed as bridges across the Willamette River all up and down the spine of the state. And so sometimes even just focusing on the things that we share in common as opposed to our differences is a, is a way of actually um, widening the tent. Um, okay? Yeah, we had the Oregon Values and Belief Center uh, as a presenter about eight months oh, yeah. ago with our organization. So- Oh, that's cool. They're Good. doing yeah. excellent work. I'm glad you shared that. I yeah. wanted as a, a final word to share um, a resource I discovered the other day. Um, Steve, see if uh, you're familiar with this and, and also might be someone you could collaborate with, but it's a, uh, it's a podcast called Reimagine uh, done by Eric Smith, uh, former CEO of Google. And through that, he created an organization called Smith Futures, uh, which invests in young people for entrepreneurial projects, as well as uh, 
education. And it does seem like they have uh, grants for organizations like uh, SAGE that are doing this kind of work. So I wanted to bring that to your attention, as well as uh, it's a very um, innovative podcast talking to world leaders on the uh, biggest problems of, of our day. So I love uh, it. Steve, thank you so much for your presentation today and the time you spent with us. It was outstanding.